Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Transcromic, Transco, Transcriptomics short talk session uh, at BIOC 2021. Uh, we will start the talks in just a minute, but the uh, required uh, intro stuff. So please, there is a Q&A. If you want to put your questions in there, we will hold all the questions until the very end for all the speakers. So please also put the speaker's name in the question so we know who it's through. Um, feel free to use the chat for general comments or questions uh, 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 to everybody during that. Um, what else do we have? Uh, there's emoticons at the bottom, which you've seen. Please use these judiciously. They're, they are great. They're wonderful for feedback. Some people do find them a little annoying if they get too much, but I do like them overall. Um, and if for some reason, if you have to leave early, the video of the session will be available. It says a couple hours, but they've actually been coming up online quite fast after the session is complete. Okay, so I will move on to introducing our first speaker, who's Wei Shi from the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Research Institute in Melbourne, Australia. Um, it is 5 a.m. there, so he is not with us. He hopes to join us by the end of the session to answer some questions. And he'll be talking about uh, our subread mapping quantification of RNA-seq data. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wei Shi. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present our work. So today, uh, I would like to uh, present the by conduct a package called R sub rate. Uh, we have been developing this package for uh, the last 10 years. Uh, and uh, before I talk about the functions in this package, I would like to not, uh, acknowledge Young Leo and Gordon Smith for their contribution to this project. So particularly Young, um, he has been the uh, main software engineer uh, for this project. Uh, and he has uh, implemented almost all the functions uh, in this package. So uh, R sub uh, contains functions for uh, mapping reads to uh, a reference genome. Um, this can be RNA seq arrays or DNA seq arrays. Uh, it also uh, includes a function uh, called uh, feature counts uh, for uh, counting reads to uh, genes. Uh, and uh, it also has a new function recently developed uh, for generating UMI counts for 10x single cell data. Uh, Rsubread also has functions for detecting um, uh, axon axon junctions, SNPs, short indels, and the structural variants. But in this uh, short talk, I will just focus on uh, the functionalities for quantifying RNA seq data, including both the single cell and the RNA seq data uh, and the bulk RNA seq data. So, as uh, as most of you know, uh, once a uh, RNA, RNA sample is sequenced, there will be a massive amount of reads generated, and these reads need to be mapped to reference genome and then be assigned to features such as uh, genes. So. Uh, Seven or eight years ago, we developed a, a liner called Subarate, uh, which uh, utilized an entirely different mapping paradigm called um, uh, Seed and Vault. So uh, under Seed and Vault, a, a, a large number of seeds uh, will be extracted from a read for mapping. Uh, this, these seeds are 16 bases long. Uh, and um, um, Uninformative subarrays will be excluded uh, from the voting. Uh, the the uninformative subarrays are those ones that are highly repetitive. So then the, um, uh, the, the remaining subarrays will uh, vote for the final location of the reads. And then uh, the gaps between the mapped subarrays will be uh, filled uh, using a dynamic programming approach. So with this approach, we can not only just map reads, but can also accurately detect the insertion deletions using the subarrays of flanking uh, uh, this uh, indel events. So we, we also developed another program called the feature counts that assigns mapped arrays uh, to genomic features, including uh, genes, exons, uh, or you know, even uh, genomic windows promoters. So it, has, it, it uses a, a, a highly novel hierarchical data structure to facilitate the assignment arrays of genes. Uh, so uh, the genome is uh, divided into many uh, bins, uh, and then within each bin, the, um, uh, the, the features, for instance, uh, exons will be grouped into blocks. 
So a map of the reads will be um, uh, quickly hashed to uh, a bin, and then within the bin, uh, the mapping location of the read will be compared to the blocks and then further to the uh, features such as axons to find its target. Uh, recently, just uh, uh, two years ago, we uh, published our subread, which compares the subread plus feature counts pipeline uh, against other pipelines for the uh, quantification of bulk RNC data. And um, the paper showed that um, uh, the uh, subread uh, is much faster than other aligners such as star and the top head. Uh, so the align F and the align G here, they both subread aligners just with different configuration. So full F means a full index, um, so which use more memory uh, G uh, means gap index, which use less memory, but uh, it's uh, the, the, the both uh, are, uh, are faster than the other aligners. So uh, with uh, 30 million reads, you can uh, finish the mapping just in around three minutes. So the feature count counting is, uh, is, uh, is also found um, to be much faster than the others, um, uh, you know, such as the summarize all labs function in the um, uh, genomics uh, features package and also the HTC account uh, program. And, uh, you know, with uh, 30 million reads, you, it, it only takes less than a minute to complete the counting. Uh, so, and we also show that um, uh, our workflow, the r workflow is also more accurate uh, than the other workflows. So here's the, the universal human reference sample and also human uh, brain reference sample. So there's uh, uh, around 1,000 genes that were validated by RT-PCR for both samples. So we just use these genes to assess the accuracy of uh, each workflow. We also use the simulation data to, uh, to, 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 uh, to assess the, uh, the accuracy. So here it shows the Pearson correlation between, uh, between computed uh, expression levels with the known truth. So furthermore, so in our subread, we also uh, have a function called subjunk, which can not only uh, fully map the reads, but also can detect the junctions and, um, um, uh, and fully map junction reads, so base, so end-to-end -end alignment. So particularly for the mapping of junction continue read, so its uh, overall performance um, uh, is considerably better than the other approach. So finally, I'll just take the last few minutes to talk about the cell counts program, which is uh, uh, a, a, a recent uh, development in our subread and it's really uh, exciting uh, new function we, we have developed uh, to us. So, uh, it's, um, so with, this you, with this function, you can, you can easily uh, quantify uh, the, the, the 10X single cell data. You know, you, you just, you just uh, you walk uh, one function call and you will get the, the, the Yumi um, uh, uh, matches table for, 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 for a entire single 10X experiment. So what it does is, uh, is uh, it takes um, BCL or FASTQ uh, uh, data as input. Uh, and so you don't need to uh, convert uh, BCL to FASTQ yourself. So cell counts will do that for you. So, and then uh, sub, uh, cell counts will map reads to the reference genome using the subread aligner. Uh, and then it will assign reads to genes using feature counts. And um, uh, after the assignment, it will collapse the reads uh, map to the same location uh, to, to Yomi's. Uh, after that, it will use a bootstrapping approach uh, to, uh, to call cells, so to determine a Yomi threshold uh, to call valid cells. Uh, uh, it also has a cell rescuing uh, procedure, so you know which allows those uh, uh, cells that have a, a total Yumi count lower than threshold, but found to not uh, to, to be not from the ambient RNAs, uh, and those cells will be rescued. And then the function will return a, a Yumi count uh, table, uh, and you can use it for further analysis. Uh, so we have uh, done some preliminary. Uh, analysis um, uh, to compare with the cell ranger and uh, the um, uh, preliminary results are very encouraging. So we used a, uh, a melanoma uh, data set with a, from a patient. Uh, so this is a published data set um, and uh, it has around 550 million reads. 
and it it uh, um, it only uses one third of the uh, the, uh, the the running time used by cell ranger, so it's much faster. Um, so it take it take actually let, uh, around an hour to complete uh, the the, quanti the entire quantification. Um, so we, we also uh, create the simulation data to um, uh, compare cell counts against the cell ranger. Uh, so, um, uh, so here we sh uh, it shows that um, uh, if you look at the, uh, the correlation of the generated Yumi uh, counts uh, for genes um, against the, uh, the, the known Yumi counts uh, 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 in the generated truth, uh, cell counts um, uh, have a slightly higher uh, accuracy uh, than cell ranger. But this evaluation is certainly ongoing. Uh, so uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for listening. So if you have any questions uh, regarding our subrate, please email me um, or send your questions uh, to the Bioconductor support uh, website. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Wei. We will move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Andre Sim from the uh, Goki Genome Institute of Singapore, and he'll be talking about uh, bamboo, a context-aware quantification of transcript expression with long-read RNA-seq data. Bamboo, a transcriptomic analysis package that utilizes long-read RNA-seq data to perform context-aware transcript quantification. We will be soon upgrading to version 2.0. I'll be discussing some of the improvements that were coming with this version. So to provide a bit of background to long read sequencing, this is actually an umbrella term that refers to multiple different methods, including pack bio and nanopore sequencing, the latter being uh, what we use to generate the data in this talk. Unlike previous RNA-seq technologies, such as short read sequencing, it's able to sequence much larger molecules and can sequence the entire mRNA molecule, for example. Previously, this used to come with a trade-off to base call accuracy, but with today's technology, it's actually much better and almost comparable to short read technology. Now with long read data, this comes with two large boosts to our transcriptomic potential. Firstly, because the reads are longer, they're more likely to uniquely map to particular isoforms. And secondly, again, because they're longer, we're able to detect multiple exons that previously wouldn't fit into a 100 base pair read. In the example I've got on the screen here, I'm showing reference annotations at a particular loci at the top in blue, uh, and then below that, I've got long read data that aligns to this particular part of the genome. Uh, and what you can see is that this particular gene and all the reference annotations uh, includes a particular exon. However, in the long read data, there are a few examples of reads that do not have this exon. So this exon has been skipped. And this is a perfect example of a read that can be detected with long, only be detected with long read data. And in short read data, reads derived from this particular transcript might have actually been divvied up uh, and provided and counted as belonging to other isoforms. Importantly, however, there are also many reads that don't map to any of the annotations. For example, the reads down the bottom here. And these could be an example of a potential uh, shorter uh, transcript, or they could be for sequencing artifacts, maybe uh, degraded RNA products or errors during uh, reverse transcription. And it is distinguishing between these two things, novel reads and then uh, sequencing artifacts that is a challenge for transcript discovery and actually motivated uh, Bamboo, the a tool that we want to be able to accurately detect these novel annotations and then use these to quantify them while minimizing the impact of these sequencing artifacts. So to do this, we have Bamboo, which uses a two module workflow. The first module is transcript discovery, where it will try and detect uh, and classify novel read classes or uh, transcripts while minimizing any potential sequencing artifacts. And then it will use these new annotations in the second module, which is transcript quantification, where it performs context-aware isoform abundance measurements. So how does our transcript discovery uh, model uh, method work? Well, first what we do is we get all the reads and we group them into what we call read classes based on those that share similar exon junctions. With these now combined read classes, we will extract uh, several features from them 
and use this in a model or to train a model that will allow us to classify read classes that represent full length transcripts and those which don't represent a full length transcript. And these labels are taken directly from the reference annotations uh, from the organism. Uh, in cases where you're using an organism that has a poor or no reference annotation, we also uh, have provided pre-trained models that we can use to, if you need to do this for the classification task. So uh, some of you might be thinking, well, isn't the intuitive way for this problem just maybe using uh, read support for these read classes? So the read classes that are most present in the data are the ones most likely to be real. Well, the CFR model uh, app competes that. We tested this on spiking data. Now spiking data is very useful because we have the ground truth. We know exactly which read classes should be present and which shouldn't be. So on the right, I've got a precision recall curve and you can see in blue the uh, output using our, the classification score from our model compared to in black, which is using a ranking based on the read support for each of the read classes from the spiking data. And you can see that the model uh, greatly outperforms the uh, read count uh, ranking, at least in this simple spiking based uh, evaluation. We next moved to doing this in real data. Now, this, as I hinted before, is a bit harder because any novel annotations we detect, we have no way of really knowing if this is a true full length transcript or maybe uh, created due to noise. Therefore, instead, what we did is we removed all the annotations from chromosome one and then attempted to reclassify all the read classes or re annotate all the um, transcripts on that chromosome. And again, what you can see is that our model in blue greatly outperformed just using read counts alone in black. In fact, we also tried using one of our pre-trained models, which is, was trained on a different cell line than in this example. And you can see that it performed almost equivalently, showing the robustness of our model. So now that we know we have a, a method of classifying if a read class is true or not, that we can apply to real data, the next challenge is dealing with the unintuitive relationship between read depth and transcript discovery. Generally in transcriptomics, as you increase uh, sequencing depth, you generally increase um, the quality of your data. However, in transcript discovery, as you increase this, you, uh, you increase the chance that, yes, you will detect lowly expressed novel isoforms, but you also start greatly incorporating these sequencing artifacts. And this is uh, highlighted in two examples with string type 2 and talon, where each dot here represents a sample across the x-axis, which represents different sequencing depths. That as the sequencing depth increased, so does the precision, uh, the precision decrease. So the number of accurate read classes of the proportion is decreasing. What we do with bamboo is we calibrate the output based on the reference annotations to a user-defined novel discovery rate. So in this example, the user is given a novel discovery rate of uh, 50% meaning that the uh, precision is calibrated along this line. And you can see that it, is sta uh, it has uh, stabilized regardless of the sequencing depth. And we believe this creates a very intuitive relationship between the input parameter and the output result. If you only want, for example, 10% uh, novel, um, novel genes or novel transcripts, that is approximately what you would get in your output. Uh, whereas if you were to use a read count threshold, for example, increasing it from two to eight, yes, you know your sensitivity will go down and your precision will go up, but you don't really know by how much it would. Next, we evaluated Bamboo against three other tools, Flare, String Toe 2, and Talon. And we did this uh, evaluation by sampling 50% of the transcripts on chromosome one and seeing how many it could reclassify uh, from those that were left over. And what you can see is that um, across almost the entire range of tested threshold values, Bamboo outperformed in sensitivity and in precision. And it was able to cover a much broader range of the possible precision values of this data. So overall, we see that uh, Bamboo is a very good uh, tool for doing transcript discovery using long read data. Finally, now that we know that we have a good transcript discovery pipeline, does this actually lead to benefits in transcript quantification? So here we're comparing Bamboo and string type 2. And what we did is we looked at the spiking data. So we're just looking at the two top plots at the moment. And we removed uh, isoforms from each of the different uh, spiking genes. 
So in the plot, the isoforms that remained in the annotations, so those that were not removed were in blue, and those that were in green were removed and then attempted to be reclassified using either bamboo or string type two. And then all of them were also quantified using the specific tools. And you can see that uh, the points in bamboo fell mainly on the diagonal, meaning that the expected uh, concentration matched with the estimated concentration more with bamboo than it did in string type two. We repeated this using real data. And again, you see the strong correlation falling on the diagonal with bamboo regardless of if, of if the gene remained as it was, um, if it remained annotated or if we removed the annotation and it needed to be um, re-annotated. So overall, we're, produce, uh, we're showing Bamboo, a long read transcriptomic analysis tool that does two things. It's able to dynamically uh, perform transcript discovery and performs context aware isoform level quantification. Uh, we believe it's a very helpful tool and very user friendly. Uh, and if this excites you, we have a preprint uh, coming soon, as well as Bamboo 2.0, which is hopefully be released in a couple of months. Also, if you're really excited by it and you want to try to use it right away, Bamboo 1.0 is available now uh, at Bioconductor and GitHub. So, of course, I'd like to thank my lab, the Guka Lab, uh, run by Dr. Jonathan Guka, as well as Chen Ying, another postdoc in the group, uh, who has worked very hard on Bamboo and the second module of quantification. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Andre. Next up, we have uh, Shilin Zhao, and he will be speaking, he's from Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and he'll be talking about RNA-seq sample size, real database sample size estimation for RNA-seq with complex design. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, just uh, give me one minute, let me share my screen. Uh, so everybody can see my screen, right? Uh, good afternoon. So um, today I'm going to uh, introduce my uh, Bioconductor R package, which is called rna Six Sample Size. It is designed for real database sample size estimation for rna Six projects. Uh, here's the outline. Uh, I will give a short introduction uh, about the uh, sample size issue in rna Six. RNA-seq project and also talk about the challenges in real database based sample size estimation. And then I will use data set from uh, RECOM2 and uh, expre expression atlas projects as a reference data and show, show you how to determine the parameters and how to use the parameters to in the workflow of RNA-seq sample size for the sample size estimation. Um, here's the introduction. So uh, the, the, project, the, the project goal for uh, RNA-seq project is usually to identify the differential genes. So um, the long hypothesis is usually the, the gene is from the same, the distribution with the same mean values in two groups. The alternative hypothesis is usually the gene is from the distribution with different mean values in, the, in that two groups. So that's easy to say that with more samples, we are more powerful and more easy to determine uh, which hypothesis we want to take. Right, so the more samples, it's more, it's better. But in real life, um, so there's a lot of issues, limitations. So this is a side, sample size and the power is usually a trade-off. For example, we may have limited budget or limited time, or the number of available samples is limited. So we need to know uh, with uh, desired power. Let's say we want to get eighty percent of power. How many samples we want to we need to have? Or our budget is only support us with ten samples in each group. So how many powers we have to identify differential genes in this design? So we need to consider a few factors like a library size, which determines the average rate for each gene, and FDR, which, which determines how, how confident we are about our results, and the number of differential genes we expected in our design, something like that. And we want to use these parameters to get a kind of size. Uh, we have uh, done a few works on this topic since 2013. So at the beginning, we use like a Poisson distribution to estimate the sample size in rn project. And then we use an electrobilomial and use it like a test and to, to, to estimate the sample size. And we, we call this method a single gene method. And uh, in 2018, uh, we developed the real data real data based method for the sample size design sample size estimation and we think which is much better than a single gene method. So here's why. 
Um, so uh, the left side finger is uh, uh, examples from TCG data. Um, in one TCG data, uh, you may have like uh, 20,000 genes. The distribution of their average read count, like the, the bottom figure, and their distribution that is person, which means their variance across the across the samples is highly different with each other. For example, their read count, some genes may only have one or two count, and some genes may have like thousands or tens of thousands count. Well, um, in single gene method, we can only select one parameter, say read count 10, dispersion one, something like that, to estimate the sample size. But in the real data set, the genes have different dispersion and different read count, which makes their sample size estimation results very different here the example in the middle so uh, with like the high um dispersing like dispersing three and the small read small read kind of one or two you may need like 20 like 200 genes to get your sample get your 80 percent power or if you have the dispersion is small and the count is not you only need like 20 or 30 genes to get your 80 percent power so the single gene, in single gene method, we usually have to choose the most conservative method, which is a large dispersion and a small uh, and a small rate count. So we will need like thousands of hundreds of samples to get 80% power. But in real data based method, we use the distribution from the, this real data, for example, this TDG data. And we will only need a few 200 or 300 samples to get the same power. So this method is much better. However, there is also a lot of challenges in real data based method. So the most challenge is, uh, and the most the most frequent question I was I was asked by the by other people is, I don't have a preliminary result. I don't have preliminary data because this is something new. This is a new question, especially to these samples, right? For example, we compare uh, uh, coronavirus coronavirus virus infection sample versus a uh, normal lung. But usually we we have normal lung, but usually we don't have the you know. Uh, the disease lung, lung tissue. Oh, the second issue is even if weights, you have real data, so how do we select the parameters? For example, the library size, the total number of your weights, or the number of expression or differential genes in your data set, or the desired fold change you want to choose. Here's the example. So if we choose fold change 1.5 or fold change 2, you choose the data, the number of estimated estimate sample size is very different. So how do we, um, deal with these issues. Uh, so we, the fortunate thing is there is a lot of public available unrestricted ex expression datasets, such as, you know, Recount2 and Expression Atlas. They, pro they uh, you know, they collect the data and uh, do like normalization and provide the phenotype data and give the description of the, what, what is this data about. So usually we can find a similar dataset from this public dataset and our project and then we can analyze this project as our reference data set and to get a better idea, say how many functions I should choose, how many genes express in this data set, something like that. So we, I will give you a few examples how to, de how to determine these parameters. Uh, here's the one example is we want to decide what is the total rate we want to get uh, or library size we want to get. The first thing is we want to know how many rates was, can be aligned to the gene level. So here's the example from the Recon2 project. The left side is GTEx, and we can we can find the tissue data in GTEx. They usually have like more than uh, seventy, uh, more than ninety five percent of rates can be aligned to the gene. So that can be can be your real rates. And in a lot of data set, which is a cell line and SHRNA data set, we can find it's only like ninety percent of rates can be aligned to the gene and can be your rate for differential detection. So if you, you want a library size of 30 meter, you probably need to sequencing like 35 meter or 40 meter rates for your for your design. So that's one. And the secondly, we want to know is how many genes is expressed in our data set. So here is the distribution of rates for the genes in different rooms. They, they're scaled to the same total rates. Uh, also, we use GTEx data on the left side and the cell data, cell line data on the right side. Uh, we can say there is more, the purple part, there's more than, and 20,000 genes expressed in this GTEx tissue samples with more than 20 rates. If we want to include more genes, like if they only have like one rate or two rates, we want also include them. So they then we will have close to 40,000 genes expression. But if we are working on a cell line data, we only have like 10,000 genes expression, 
and have has more than 20 rates, or if we want to include more than one rate, we only have like uh, 20 sentences expressed. So that's a second parameter we can use. And then we are going to the um, log to full change and uh, the number of differential genes. Uh, so here uh, I also use a uh, cell line data, which is NHB cell line data as a control in this in this public data set. Uh, so um, here, here we just uh, use them as a negative control and we randomly assign the group, this group one and group zero to them and we do a differential detection and we, we can try to say how many different genes was in this control samples and what is their full genes. So this is our like negative control. And in this resampling, we will have a, in each resampling, we will have a different number of different genes, right? So here's the distribution in resampling. And also in the resampling, we will have their full genes. Here is their full genes. So here we can get two things. One is the number of different genes in the control samples is very small. Most of them are zero. Right, so which is good. So if this is a big number like 20 or 100, so that's a red flag, it means the sample size is too small, you will have a lot of noise or a lot of like, uh, you know, a lot of uh, different genes, but in fact, they are not different, they are elective. And the full, full change, here we can identify the full change are not big. And then we also have positive control because in, the, in this data set, uh, we will have, uh, they have the same cell line, but with coronavirus infection and what is the control. So we can also use this data set to identify how many genes was expressed, that they have 10,000 genes expressed with more than 10 pounds, and the differential gene is a big number, it's 3,000. So we're not worried about that. And the full change is, but it's also small. So this data set tell us if we want to do a similar design, which means a uh, coronavirus infection um, to some cell line versus the normal cell line, we probably will identify a lot of different genes, but the effect size, the full change will be small. So we probably should set a small full change, say 1.2 or something like that, which is bio biologically meaningful. So the small full change to identify that, to do a sample size estimation. Um, here's a second example. You're just about out of time to warn you. Okay. Can you wrap it up, please? Yeah, yeah, I will, I will finish the answer right like that. So a second example is a tissue sample. So uh, it's uh, also from this data set and the normal lung tissue. And we do the sample size, it's a, do the full change in resampling and number of different genes. And also full changes in the true, uh, in the true sample, we said uh, COVID-19 patient and lung tissue versus normal tissue. And their full change is large. So in this data set, we probably can set a, not uh, full change in our sample size estimation. And this slide is to answer the question that if we do not have a, a design sample. So for example, if we only have a normal tissue, right? We don't have the delayed tissue. What can we do? If, can we use, the uh, use that to estimate dispersion? So the answer is that depends. For example, this cell line data, it indicated that dispersion is very different. If I use the both treatment versus control or use control only. But in this tissue data, the dispersion is similar, so that's okay. We use the control data only to estimate dispersion if we don't have the delayed data. Uh, so this slide just to tell you. Uh, okay, I this... think we. I have to ask you to say. Okay, sure. Bye. That's that's all. That's all. Maybe stop sharing. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you so much. And sorry, we wish we had lots and lots of time. Um, and our know. last speaker of the session um, is Seyun Oh from. Uh, um, Oh, where is it? The City University of New York. And she'll be talking about uh, genomic supersignature interpretation of RNA seq experiments through a robust, efficient comparison to public databases. Okay. Uh, Jenny, can you, see your, uh, can you see my slide? Yes, we can see oh, your okay. slide. Okay, so I, I cannot see. So, okay, so uh, let's see. Okay, thanks for the opportunity to share my work. So today I'm introducing my new package, Genomic Super Signature, developed for transfer learning and efficient database search. So we were motivated to develop this tool because too often large existing database is not used to understand the newly generated gene expression data. There have been attempts to use the existing database, but some are limited because they tend to be like hard to use or require heavy computing, like for example, users should train their own model or work only on a specific type of data, for example, like only applicable for immune cells and mice cells, et cetera. 
So different, uh, different from those existing tools, Genomic Super Signature provides the pre-trained model and the R packages to apply that model on a new data set. So overall, it allow and, or, and allows more universal application across different platforms and different biology. So our pre-trained model is called RAV model, which stands for Replicable Axis of Variation. This diagram summarizes the RAV model building process on the top panel and its application on new data using the genomic super signature package. So current version of RAV model is trained on about 45,000 samples from 536 different studies. And we did a PCA on the gene expression profiles and clustered the top pieces to build the RAVs. The collection of RAVs for the RAV index are further annotated with match terms and gene sets. And RAV index annotation and the metadata associated with the originating studies together create RAV model. And so this is what provided to the users. So once users bring their own data, genomic super signature assign quantitative values to the input data and connects it with the existing database and suggests interpretation shown in this blue box. And everything inside this blue box is done by genomic super signature. So overall, genomic super signature and RAV model together construct this knowledge graph connecting different databases and enables the interpretation of a new data in the context of the existing database on the conventional laptop. So importantly, RAVs are not just an index, but also represents a specific biological features so it can be used for transfer learning as well. I will go through these examples briefly in the next few minutes. So first, in the next two slides, I will demonstrate the efficient database searching by genomic super signature. So first step to use this package is to find the RAV that's relevant to your data set. The most straightforward way is using validate function in the top example, I apply RAV model on TCGA breast cancer data set and found that RAV221 is one of the highly associated RAV. In the bottom, uh, bottom example, I applied a RAV model on a five TCGA RNA-seq data set and found again RAV221 and maybe RAVA68 are relevant to the breast cancer. So once you identify the RAV of your interest, you can instantly print out associated mesh term in a word cloud in which pathways and relevant studies. So here, RAV221 shows breast as one of the highly represented mesh term and breast cancer related gene sets and three studies on tumor, uh, breast tumor. And genomic super signature also helps to interpret PCA wizard. The validation process under the hood is searching for RAVs most similar to the top pieces of the input data set. So the information can be that information can be extracted separately and used to understand what kind of features are represented by different PCs. These are, this functionality is implemented as annotate PC here and plot annotated PCA function. And as I mentioned earlier, RAVs represent biological features, so we can use genomic super signature beyond the efficient database search. In the next two slides, I will show benchmarking examples on digit subtyping and transfer learning with genomic super signature. In this first example, we benchmarked RAV model against the disease-specific model, which was trained on eight colon cancer microarray data set. We applied both models on 10 colon cancer test data set and compared their performance on separating discrete subtypes labeled here with the different colors. Even though the training data sets were completely different, both platform-wise and biology-wise, our model shows comparable performance to the disease specific model on the same on that specific disease. So because RAV model was trained on heterogeneous data set, it can potentially expand to the other disease as well. 
And the second benchmarking example is transfer learning. So here, these two scatter plots are from two independent data sets. So using the available metadata of data set one, we identify REV 1551 as the one explaining neutrophil count feature here. So the um, metadata here. And we apply this REV to the different data set, data set two, to infer the neutrophil count. Because there is no neutrophil, uh, really, uh, neutrophil metadata from data set two, we compare the REV assigned score with the neutrophil estimate. And then, and confirm that REV 1551 can explain the phenotype of data set two. So one REV can explain the same phenotype in two distinct data sets. This use case suggests that genomic super signature can be used to infer missing data or identify weak and underrepresented biological signatures, leveraging the prior knowledge. And in conclusion, genomic super signature demonstrates efficient and coherent database searching, robustness to batch, batch effects and heterogeneous training data, and transfer learning capacity. The major improvement relative to the existing approaches are increased the usability through pre-computed model and package, and versatility by not being limited to any specific biology and applicable across different platforms. And third, the modularity of the model allows an easy expansion of it and its scalability thanks to the fast training procedure. And one of the main future plans is expanding RAB model to the different training data sets, such as single cell data, different species, and microbiome. We also plan to add more annotations like different gene sets and additional metadata of originating studies. Any detailed informa detail information is available in the manuscript and back package site and use case site. Also, during my uh, cloud-based genomics workshop tomorrow, I will cover how to set up the like, reproducible environment of genomic super signature use cases in Terra. And actually, I'm pretty early, but I want to thank Sean and Levi for their help from the very beginning and every troubleshooting steps. Also, thanks all the other collaborators for their help and insight and our funding. And thanks for all of you listening. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, thank you to all of our speakers. It was very interesting. Um, I People usually are trickling in with their Q's and A's, so please put them in if you have. Um, I will start off with one, um, and this is for Andre. Uh, so my understanding so far of long weed sequencing is that it's best for transcript identification and that the quantification of different transcripts, particularly towards the goal of differential expression of genes, um, is not quite there yet with long read data. Um, do you have any comments uh, on that? I would say that that's changing rapidly because earlier uh, experiments, the sequencing depth of long read data was very low. So it made the ability to, the, the statistical power to actually differentiate was not that, not that powerful. But now that we're uh, able to sequence at much higher depths, I think it's definitely um, possible. And actually, I'd say it has many advantages over short read data, since you can be a lot more specific about which transcripts are being quantified. Um, and we do actually show some comparisons. We, we, we're hoping to release a paper soon where we're showing some comparisons between long read and short read data with quantification. So keep a look out there. All right, good. Do you think it might become competitive with uh, short read data for? I, I definitely say, believe so, yes. Oh, that'll be interesting. But I mean, I am a bit biased regarding that since we work with long read data. <laughs> Okay. Um, what else did I have? Um, so, let's see the questions we got. All right, we got one in here. Let's uh, show one on stage. So, for this is for Sayun. Um, what happens if the new data you feel it feed it happens to be a data set already used to develop the RAV model? Could you still gain new insights? That's pretty interesting question. Yeah. Uh, I haven't tried that feedback, uh, but I will. Oh, so let me think. So I did. Oh, so that I think that's definitely my next to do list. And I haven't tried exactly that one, but I would say that that can bring still the different uh, insight in a way that it can 
So the thing is like, because you are co compare whatever data set with the web, which is like more robust signal. So it's less, uh, it's less affected by like, it's like noise, they're less affected by it's like sample data's own noise. So that in that way, I think you can uh, find more reliable interpretation, and then the connection, like uh, connection to the existing data space part, database part, is definitely still useful. And I think transfer learning part is also you are using the specific web to talk, uh, see the uh, talk of uh, interpret the data set. So that should work fine. And uh, because the model pre uh, during the model pr uh, building process, uh, the PCs are like clustered, similar PCs are clustered and then the and then it's averaged to make the rev itself. So it's even though you are bring the same uh, the part of training data set, it's not actually say like, that is kind that signature signal is kind of merged into the more gener, gener, generic signature. So I will, my short answer is yes, you can still I think you will still get the insight, but definitely I will try that. Okay. All right. Um, I have one for Sheelan. Um, so on the idea of uh, sample size estimation, it seems like you were doing this in context of, you know, disease studies where you're trying to decide if you need to do hundreds versus thousands and, and how much can you afford. Um, I work on the other end where most people, I can barely get them to do three replicates per group. And the, the, always the joke is we never bother to do Size, sample size <laughs> estimations because it, the answer is always more than you can afford. So is this useful for a smaller scale experiment or is it only for maybe larger, more large scale experiments? So um, I really you know, like this question. That's a good question. So usually before we have this software, uh, the sample size answer is what, what are you doing? Cell line three, a mouse 18, and the tissue more than <laughs> something like that. So um, usually, like you said, we usually we cannot afford that such large sample size. But for cell lines, um, usually we can do that because the estimate sample size is usually like five versus five or ten versus ten. So we can usually do that. But uh, but if you uh, if you don't really don't have that limit, but I still think sample size can help because you can get a better idea how many power you have. If you have three versus three, you know you probably lost eighty percent of the different genes. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, we have another one. This is for Sayun again. Uh, many databases, repositories um, like GoTerms is a bit biased towards cancers. Have you tested your genomic super signatures on other biological niches? Okay, so I assume that your uh, your question is whether I apply this this signature to the data set, input the, the input test data set, which is not cancer. I will say uh, haven't done a lot like. But uh, actually, one of the, the one of the benchmarking is not a cancer data set. That's uh, actually actually just like if non cancerous blood data set, and we still get uh, extract the uh, uh, meaningful data uh, meaningful information. So I think it's pretty much uh, it's not really cancer limited at this point. And then the training data set is also. I think it's a little bit biased to cancer. I cannot really think of, it's not really, on, uh, I can't remember exactly, but I uh, I have the data set, like how much of the my training data, data set is cancer or not, and it wasn't fully cancer. And then when I try to the different uh, input data set, like different biology, I see the uh, still meaningful information from that. Uh, from other things. Okay. And then where will the rap model continuously be relearned as time goes? Oh, definitely. So that's, uh, so we learn this, like sounds like it should like machine learning is learned by itself. But I will, that, uh, the, my plan is like maintaining as in a part of my future plan, I mentioned that I want to expand rap model. So right now it's a uh, human uh, RNA seq data set. I tested with a little bit of mini test and the microarray data set is fine, like working the same this uh, using my model building structure works in on the micro data micro array data set so i definitely want to change the training data set so as i mentioned like different species microbiome etc and then i want to have like different series of like cancer based on or like so uh, cancer based on the uh, training data set and microbiome based on different uh, training data set, or even expanding, like adding the different annotation, because my training process doesn't interrupt the 
still keep the connection between the training data set and the final model because the other models kind of disconnect the connection so you cannot really decipher where a certain signature comes from but my model still can keep it so any new metadata associated originating like training study i can incorporate in the late in later it's like new new module so that's the plan i i'm I plan to do so. Yes, I think it will be learned as time goes. Okay. I have one last quick question for you, Sayun. Okay. Um, so, is there any way that once you have this RAV model, you can figure out what factors or measurements or whatever went into building the model? Yes. So, RAV model, so I didn't talk too much about how I build because of the technical part. But the thing is, RAB model is like collect the top piece and then uh, the top pieces of different training data set and then cluster them. So actually in the RAB model itself, there is information about certain RAB. So there is, it's an index, there are a bunch of RABs. Actually, my model has almost 5,000 RABs and each RAB, where it comes, which PC of study comes from and what is the variance explained by the specific pieces in the so you have all that information and then some of the interpretation that the visualization i show those are actually counted or those like variance explained by certain pieces come from uh, composing the rev so all those information is traceable so yes okay great all right well we are about at uh, 10 till a little after so Join me in again thanking all our speakers for a wonderful session. And depending on your time frame, you're either maybe going to sign off for the day or keep going. So we'll look forward to seeing you at the rest of the conference. Thanks, everybody.